There he is. Hi, how are you? Hello, good, how are you? Uh, let's see, I can't remember if you're <laughs> Jeremy or Brad. I'm Jeremy. Jeremy, okay. Hi, Jeremy. I'm Brad. Brad, Brad good to yeah. see you. So let me see, uh, the background is reasonably okay. Yes. Should I oh, slide yeah. that white board yep. over a bit? Unless it's proprietary information. No, no, it's not. <laughs> I don't know what's on it. <laughs> okay. I... Uh, I first heard of uh, Gilbert Ling when I was a graduate student um, uh, long ago uh, at the University of Washington, uh, University of Pennsylvania, sorry. Um, and um, we, I was in a department that was a biomedical engineering department run by a guy named Herman Schwann who studied bound water. And for me, this was so uninteresting that I uh, developed no passion or even interest in the subject. But along the course, a guy named Gilbert Ling was mentioned. Um, and I didn't really strike m much of a note with me. But, but then uh, it was a year or two later, and there was a banquet of some sort. And I was sitting next to one of my fellow graduate students, and he pointed over to uh, some person a couple of tables away. He whispered in my ear, that's Gilbert Ling. That's the guy who has some pretty weird ideas about water. <laughs> And, and I saw him there, and I recognized him, and then I completely forgot about him for many years. And I forgot about him until the time that a colleague invited me to a conference in, uh, in Budapest. Uh, that it was a con uh, it, the, the purpose of, of the conference was to commemorate the life of a, a famous biophysicist named Ernst. And Ernst had two... Um, areas of, of interest. One was muscle contraction, the other was water. And I was invited to speak about muscle contraction because um, this biophysicist had ideas that differed from the mainstream, as, as do I. So I fit right into place there. But what moved me more than presenting about muscle contraction was listening to Gilbert Ling, meeting him, and meeting a dozen other people who had evidence to support his point of view. So that was my introduction to Gilbert. I was totally impressed by not only by by Gilbert and the discussions, but also by by the people who attended this meeting. And what about his work that you that you maybe first read or first heard from someone grabbed you and you were like, hey, maybe there's something here? Because what we heard from a lot of people is just how how dense it is at first. And so it loses most people before they they can actually understand it. It certainly is is a high density, no doubt about it. I think Gilbert had had a tendency to uh, maybe to write for himself and a few other people, but uh, not for the average scientist, let alone the average layperson. So it, it, it was dense. And, and in, in fact, um, how I came to appreciate his, his, his work was, well, it's a startling difference from the conventional view. And... Um, and I did, I did manage to um, try to read uh, one of his books, um, and I was deeply impressed by what he had to say. I gave that book to um, uh, some of my students and postdocs to read, uh, some whose background uh, uh, I thought could actually uh, afford them the opportunity to penetrate more easily than I could. And I got uniform feedback, and the feedback was, this is amazing, the stuff that Gilbert produced, the idea that water inside the cell was structured or organized like a, like a crystal. They found, uh, uniformly found, found this, uh, that concept to be um, uh, penetrating, critically important. And so after getting that kind of feedback from my students, uh, uh, confirming what I had felt myself, I decided to take it upon myself to make Gilbert's ideas known uh, to the community, to the more general community at large. And I did it. I wrote a book called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. And the book was ostensibly um, put forth to, to make Gilbert's ideas understandable to, to scientists and even perhaps to the lay community. I'm not sure if I succeeded. The reviews of the book um, were uh, polarized. Uh, one, one scientist from Harvard said, this is a 305-page preface to the future of cell biology. Uh, and um, others said, this is 
uh, complete nonsense, uh, the, um, basically reiterating the, the ideas of Gilbert Ling, which everybody knows are wrong. So, so it was it was the kind of response that I um, that I expected, but but it launched me. It launched our lab in, into a uh, pursuit, a uh, avid pursuit of the properties of water, and so our interest started from there. It started with Gilbert Ling, absolutely clearly. Um, that's great. In that, yeah, in that book, it seems like well, obviously you took an entire book to explain essentially what Gilbert's explaining. Is it possible for you to like more briefly sum up what Gilbert's position is? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I can sum up. Uh, I think I can sum up his position and pardon me if I err. Um, um, uh, Gilbert's position is that, is that um, uh, inside the cell, um, the, the, the inside the cell is filled with macromolecules and, um, and then there's water in between the macromolecules and and every water molecule sits really close to one of those surfaces and and those surfaces have the capacity to organize the water molecules in into um, into ordered arrays so instead of instead of the idea <coughs> excuse me instead of the idea of water molecules acting as or behaving as they do in a simple glass of liquid water. Here, the water mo molecules are polarized. So each one is a dipole that is like a little bean with a positive at one end and a negative at one end. And these line up along the surfaces um, of, of those macromolecules inside the cell. And, and one builds upon another, sort of like dominoes lining up. And it's not just uh, one or two uh, water molecular layers, but Gilbert argued it could be many, dozens or even even hundreds uh, uh, of molecular layers. So, so that means the inside of the cell um, is structured in a way that's uh, vastly different from, from the textbook view. The te textbook view says that uh, the molecules of water inside the cell are you know, they say implicitly, very much the same as molecules in a glass of water. Gilbert said, no, that's not the case. And he goes on from there uh, with uh, quite a lot of detail to support the point of view and, and to explain various biological phenomena. Um, and he presents a lot of evidence, uh, even though the books are rather dense, um, a lot of evidence to, to support this point of view. And that's what caught me because it's not just a conjecture. Um, it's actually a hypothesis supported by a lot of evidence. But not many people were willing to listen. And this is the problem. And I think it's because of that that Gilbert, in his later years, um, tended to, uh, to sort of disappear into obscurity. But his ideas... Um, um, well, certainly inspired our group and it inspired many other people to co consider what's, what's going on inside the cell or even beyond the cell. The idea of what he called structured water has now become, um, um, well, I don't know if we would, if you, I would call it accepted among mainstream scientists, but, but certainly a lot more attention is being paid to that idea. I think one one way that would be helpful for people to differentiate between the two models, let's say that the membrane pump model and the AIH model of the cell uh, would be like an analogy. And we remember when we first chatted with you, you had the analogy of the doggy doors for the membrane pump model. So um, Gilbert, uh, you know, because he became long in the tooth, he was around when the idea of membrane pumps uh, first arose, and and I recollect that Gilbert was not enthusiastic uh, about that and began to do experiments. And the experiments he did, uh, and at the time I should say that the only pump that had been discovered uh, at that by that time was the sodium pump. Uh, and Gilbert said he had several arguments. The first was an experimental observation. Uh, his experiments, he what he did was to pull the plug on the pump, and that is to poison the cell using a cocktail of multiple poisons that <laughs> assured that there was no way that the cell could get a whole lot of energy to power the pump, the sodium pump. 
And he was able to conclude in the results of his experiment that, that the results of the putative sodium pump, that is the separation of ions from inside and outside the cell, that, that was retained for many hours. And he calculated, um, being generous to the other, uh, other, uh, other side, how much energy would be required. And I think he came to the conclusion, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but that in the most generous case, uh, that the cell... Um, that the requirement was something like 30 times the energy that the poison cell could muster. That seemed pretty, pretty conclusive uh, to me, but as you know, um, right now, the number of uh, pumps that are, have been suggested in the membrane, I, uh, one of a former student who's sort of working in that area told me that it was more than 2,000 pumps. <laughs> so... Um, if you, you got a problem, and it's also a problem of real estate because, you know, where on earth are these pumps located in the membrane? The membrane has only such space, <laughs> you know, limited space. And so, you know, you can't fit more cars in the parking lot than, than there are spaces available. So that was, that was another argument that Gilbert uh, brought, brought forth. So um, that certainly convinced me. Um, I, I think that the idea of pumps or transporters, as they're now called, it, the idea is bankrupt. Um, and Gilbert provided the evidence. And yet, um, people are still believing that, uh, in, in all the textbooks that this is a part of, of biology. And then there's the issue of channels, and Gilbert didn't talk about that, but, but the issue is much the same. There are so many channels now, I think a little bit fewer than um, the number of, of pumps, but there's this similar real estate issue. And, you know, if you, in fact, if you, uh, if you uh, do electron microscopy and identify the membrane, you can't see these gadgets that are supposed to be sitting there. So this is another observation that raises, raises question. But you brought up the dog door analogy, and let, let me just uh, mention that. The analogy that you're mentioning is, you know, once the dog door is open, uh, it's big enough to let the dog through. But if it's big enough to let the dog through, then what about, what about the, the uh, rats and the mice and all the other, the cats and all the other smaller animals that, while it's open, can climb through equally? See, and, and that, that analogy um, is, I think, apropos of the situation with, with channels, because we, when you think about it, according to the theory that's put forth, um, the membrane is full of channels, one for, for each ion or each, each substance. And, you know, so the door opens, uh, the channel opens, and the substance goes through. But think about the logic of this. So suppose you think about the channel that exists for the biggest solute for which channels have been proposed. So the channel opens and that galumphing solute can work its way through from outside to inside or vice versa. But what about the other smaller entities? Why don't they just go pouring through, like water, for example, or small ones, while it's open? And if they can go through, then why do you need a separate channel to let them through? You know, it's like putting a finger in the dike, a hole in the dike, uh, but there are other holes right near that that are even bigger, and um, and the, uh, the the water comes right through. So, so those are those are some of the reasons why the idea that originated with Gilbert about uh, about how the the pumps don't make any sense at all uh, um, has uh, I think the arguments hold today, and they extend not only to pumps but also to channels. But the textbook pays no attention. Um, and so still we're replete with channels and pumps and many of the pharmaceutical companies use these concepts to explain the action of their pharmaceuticals. Um, and do you have a, a, an idea of a sort of visual metaphor for the, the AIH? So instead of pumps and channels transporting molecules in and out of the cell, um, like a doggy door, um, how do you see or visualize the AIH differently? The, the structured water inside the cell excludes many things, including sodium. So the sodium stays outside the cell. On the other hand, uh, because of the special characteristics, characteristics of potassium, potassium remains in the cell in high concentration. In fact, it was Ludwig Edelmann who did 
experiments uh, to demonstrate that the potassium was actually bound to the surfaces of the macromolecules and proteins, and that's why there is a high concentration um, of potassium inside and sodium outside. So you don't necessarily need need um, pumps and channels to to achieve this. I mean, that's the essence. There's there's a lot more that that can be said. I'm not the best person to say it, but but basically, Gilbert explains two of those important features uh, on on that basis. And so, being able to sort of take a direct step from what you got out of Gilbert's work, where did that lead you? It changed my career. It changed my life. Uh, it it uh, as soon as I I had written the sales gels and the engine of life. Uh, my curiosity um, commanded me to 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 do experiments, and so it did take more than a few years before our laboratory uh, changed phase from dis- uh, from studying the mechanism of muscle contraction to discovering uh, something new about structured water or something important. I think we achieved that, and um, that, that's not the purpose of your interview, but we were able to confirm that certainly that the the water inside the cell was ordered, although um, our evidence suggests a way that's a bit different from from the way that Gilbert conceived it. And it's opened so many new doors of opportunity um, uh, with huge interest from many people uh, um, to to explore the features of water. We started a conference, an uh, annual conference. Gilbert attended one or two early on when his health didn't preclude his attendance, um, and we were thrilled to to have him there to present as you know the the one hero in the, in, in that field. Um, and at, at what point did um, did you start to maybe question or modify certain aspects of of the AIH, or maybe it was yeah. just time things became clearer? But tell us. yeah, so we could we could identify where the structured water was because this structured water excludes solutes. So we, we had an experimental system um, where we could see what Gilbert would call structured water developing because, because it excluded these particles. We could see in the microscope and the regions were st- astonishingly large. They were, they were up to even a half a millimeter. You could see it with your naked eye. And we stuck electrodes in and we found out that that typically these regions have negative charge. And according to Gilbert Ling's idea, they shouldn't be charged at all because they're simply water molecules, which are neutral, which are lined up and stacked in a way. So because we, we consistently found negative charge, um, it, it led to the difficult uh, conclusion that Gilbert, Gilbert's ideas are, you know, certainly on track, but because they missed this particular observation, we, we had to, uh, to make some, some revision. That, that's where it came. And is that, is that the only thing over time that um, should be updated, or are there any other aspects? Well, there are more aspects, yeah. Uh, and uh, I know this focuses on Gilbert, not on our stuff, so, I, you know, I'm a little bit modest to go into great detail, but, but okay, so just one more thing. There, there are actually quite a few, um, and they're laid out in the, in, in the book. Um, uh, one of the things that is because the, what we call the fourth phase of water, um, or sometimes we call it exclusion zone because it excludes solutes and particles, um, we found out not only did that region have negative charge, but the region of ordinary water beyond that had positive charge. And so what you have is like a battery. And we found that this battery is fueled, the battery charge, the separation of charge is fueled by energy from the sun, by light. We have clear evidence on that. And that's not, neither one of those uh, is, is part of Gilbert's, uh, as I understand it, Gilbert's idea. So it, it became a little bit, little bit more, I don't know, com- complex or simpler. I'm not sure which term to use, but it had properties that could be exploited for um, understanding and, and also practical use. I think an Im- important sort of thought experiment would be like an alternate universe 2020 where Gilbert's ideas um, decades ago were actually taken seriously, 
and became maybe mainstream, what do you think would be different in terms of, you know, uh, medicine and health and scientific research biology if that became a prevailing paradigm? Uh, the first is that every textbook would need to be rewritten because um, the centrality of the idea that the water inside the cell is ordinary water, uh, almost everything builds on that. Uh, so many things build on it. And if it's not true, then we, we have a different different paradigm. So that's one. And the second is a lot of people would begin studying water. Um, so right now, as you, as you know, um, study of water is it might be considered something like cottage industry. Uh, only only few people have interest because, uh, well, because of Gilbert's history and 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 subsequently um, the debacles that took place when other scientists uh, began finding really interesting interesting issues uh, about water. Um, so there were, were two that I, I can think of, probably more. One was Boris Deryagin, who, um, who found some interesting features uh, of, of water that looked like another phase of, of water. And, um, and, and um, his work uh, was disparaged by Western scientists who said, oh, he was dealing with contamination that had nothing to do with water. And the story about him is, uh, is that um, although he himself retracted, the retraction came under pressure from the government because the government didn't want the Soviet government at the time uh, felt a little uh, uneasy about accepting the blame for what must be an artifact. And so they said, you accept the blame. And the consequences uh, might have been uh, pretty serious. I heard this from a couple of people who uh, had associated with Deryagin on a daily basis. They told me the same thing independently. So he was more or less forced to recant. But he believed he was right from the day until the, until the day he died. So with these debacles in the past, not too many people have the courage to, uh, to dip their toe into the water and, and begin studying it. It's scary because uh, they can easily be the target of retribution from people who, who uh, have interest in preserving the status quo. What about taking it a little further, though, um, and it's, I know it's very hard to, uh, to extrapolate this, but how um, pharmaceutical research might be different, like in terms of trying to figure out uh, treatments for diseases like Alzheimer's or cancer or what have you. Uh, very different because water, uh, water is central uh, uh, to everything the cell does. Uh, Gilbert thought so, and, and we think so even, even more because we discovered a lot more about about water that uh, is relevant to uh, to pathologies and such, and and one of the things we found is that if if um, if the cell is if the cell is deficient in uh, what Gilbert calls structured water, what we call easy or fourth phase water, it's dehydrated, and if it's dehydrated, we found evidence that uh, many 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 cells that are um, um, deficient in this kind of water are pathological, and, and the reverse is that. Pathological cells uh, 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 often um, th there, there's evidence that requires a bit to explain, so I, I'll skip it. But um, that they're they're deficient in in structured or as, again easy water, and so a clinical approach would be um, to to some of these pathologies would be uh, 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 simply to take measures that restore the amount of structured or easy water to the cell. You see, and there's a very different paradigm from what prevails clinically today, where every every syndrome gets a drug, and some of them work, but a lot of them don't work, and many of them have side effects, and that may include death. So your hypothetical that this becomes or has become mainstream or will become mainstream, I, I'm not sure it will or how long it will, but it should, has critical implications for uh, what happens in the clinic. So it seems like it's just taking, tweaking the understanding of the cell that just the way that water molecules and proteins fit together is, creates a total paradigm shift in understanding how life works, essentially. A complete paradigm shift. Absolutely. Yeah. Complete. Um, water, as you know, um, but 
some of your listeners may not know. Um, you know, in, in standard mainstream biology, uh, water almost doesn't appear in the textbook. Uh, the first chapter will say something about water, and then you'll have trouble finding the word water uh, in, in the rest of the book. And um, uh, because water is simply considered to be a, a bathing medium, a medium that bathes the more important molecules of life. So there's a almost singular focus right now on, on genomics. And of course, genes are important. Uh, nobody doubts that. But for the functioning of the cell, if, if the paradigm of Gilbert and some of the stuff that we've done afterward, if, if these paradigms are in, indeed valid, then everything changes because water is central. It's not um, um, simply a bathing medium. It's hard to imagine that, you know, that water is, uh, is just a bathing medium because the cells have so much water. So if you think of it in terms of volume, um, uh, we're typically 70% or so. It depends how old we are in many factors, but roughly two-thirds water. But if you consider it in terms of the number of molecules or the fraction of molecules that are water molecules, in other words, if you line up all the molecules in the cell and count them one by one, you get water, 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 water. <laughs> more than 99 out of 100, if you do the arithmetic, more than 99 out of 100 molecules are water molecules. And it makes sense because the water molecule is so small and to amount to two-thirds of the volume of the cell, you need a lot of water molecules. So we're at 99 out of 100. And to imagine, to envision um, that, um, that they do nothing except essentially bathe the more important molecules of life, it really stretch, stretches um, credibility to think that. Do you feel hopeful that there can still be change, like fundamental change in terms of thinking about water and thinking about the cell? And have there been some changes or inklings of that over the last, you know, five years, 10 years? Well, uh, for water, yes. Uh, for other areas, I'm not so sure. I think one of the reasons that, that water um, has become interesting, it stems from partly from Gilbert Ling and partly from what we've been doing, various water-related activities to to present evidence and also, I mean, frankly, to popularize the idea of water being uh, central and, and interesting. In other fields, you know, I, I don't follow those fields as closely as I do the water field, but I, I'm less confident that things are changing. And um, a, as you know, but maybe other people are not, not so well aware, I, I, I think, as Gilbert did too, that it's the system, the system of doing science that prevents um, scientific revolutions like Gilbert's from becoming mainstream. Um, and and the, the, the issue has to do with funding. Every scientist needs money. Without money, you can't run a laboratory. Without running a laboratory, um, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't do experiments. And so the money is critical. But now, unlike the way it was 60, 70, or 100 years ago, now science has become institutionalized, and you get your money from government institutions like the National Institutes of Health or National Science Foundation and such. And the way you do it is inimical to, um, uh, to getting money, because if you're a revolutionary, you submit your proposal, who reviews it? Well, the experts in the field. And if you have a round-earth proposal in... Um, in a society where everybody knows the earth is flat, just look out your window and you can see it. It's hard to get money because the reviewers will be the people who believe in flat earth. And uh, they don't want to be pushed aside by some upstart who thinks the earth is round, no matter what his evidence so, or her evidence. So the chances of getting funding um, for a radical idea are not great. And, and most canny scientists know that. And it's not that they lack creativity, it's just that they're more practical in their understanding that if they try to push um, uh, an agenda that challenges the status quo, the chances of remaining in business dwindle a lot. And a lot of people have stopped doing science because they couldn't get funding for their uh, ideas that challenge mainstream views. So I think to summarize, it's the system that prevents uh, radical ideas um, scientific revolutions from coming through and the system needs to change so we've 
invented something called the Institute for Venture Science. Um, the URL, in case anybody's interested, is ivscience.org. IV, as in intravenous, <laughs> Institute for Venture, ivscience.org. Um, and we hope that that's going to change the way science is done by setting up a model that emphasizes uh, the importance of funding scientists who challenge mainstream views that simply don't work. We're hopeful. It seems like the right road. We think it is. We're excited about it. And uh, we think we're on a, a good course. Yeah, I'm at least hopeful that when people pursue these ideas on the edge, that you know, at least pieces of them trickle on down to other people doing work and it slowly works its way in even if it doesn't cause a revolution? Well, we, we hope to create revolutions. We, we, have, a, we have a model, uh, uh, because I, after all, you know, the world as we see it today is full of problems. Uh, everybody knows that, everybody recognizes it, and they're getting worse rather than better on multiple fronts. And, you know, while there may be some socio-political, socio-economic and political solutions, I think that new science uh, is almost guaranteed, or revolutionary science is guaranteed to produce some results because, because um, whenever in, in history, whenever there's been a, a genuinely a new finding or a scientific revolution, it's always come with practical consequences, with technology that nobody could ever have dreamed of um, that, that happened, which, as you know, technologies can bring solutions to, to problems. Um, and, and that's why we, we, we think that, that by setting up this institute, and not only does it satisfy everybody's needs to understand nature, um, with, which has existed since the advent of mankind, but also to eventually produce to produce technologies that can help fight all of the problems that we face today increasingly. So it's really important. And um, that's why we, we hope for success and we hope that we can create revolutions. The model is, is designed to do that. I, I won't go into detail because that's not the theme uh, today. Well, we'll definitely include a link to it. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. I'm feeling pretty covered, Jeremy. Any lingering questions? I feel like we got good stuff. All right, guys, I got to go. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye.